Welcome spring to everybody. I'm Dorothy Cummings, and this is CDNY Country Dance Floor. Um, we have a wonderful program for you tonight. Um, tonight's talk is by Daniel Popowich, one of CDNY's finest callers. Um, we are following our general format, which is we'll start the presentation in a couple of minutes. It'll be about a half hour or 40 minutes. Um, do uh, prepare some questions for our Q&A, and then we will uh, go out of uh, this, this screen share format, and we'll just go into gallery view and do some socializing at the end. Um, but in the meantime, the session's being recorded, and it's uh, live streaming to Facebook. So if you do not wish to be live streamed or recorded, uh, you will want to turn off some buttons. If you want to check where that recording is, it's right here on the, the YouTube channel for CDNY. We've got this link on the CDNY page. If you wish, you can turn off the video with the stop video. And we ask you to remain muted during the presentation. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for, for speaking at the very end during the social time. Meantime, please do collect and type your questions into the chat box. Coming up at CDNY, next week, there is a CDNY Live hosted by Cynthia Shaw, that variety show that you may have seen by now with lots of live music, recorded music, and cooking, often enough. Um, in two weeks, at this very place, we have Country Dance Lore with Marty Faker and Sharon Green. And they are going to be talking about the New York Play Football. There may be, and I haven't listed here, but there may be an event on Sunday the 11th. Uh, that one, if it does come together, there will be an email sent out with all the particulars, but that's, if it happens, it will be Sunday afternoon, um, the 11th of April. But let's talk about next time here on CDMY Lore. Marty Fager and Sharon Green are going to talk to us about the New York Wall. They've collected a lot of memorabilia that they want to share with you. There's videos, there's dance programs, there's uh, MCs, there's pictures of old locations, um, some of them as old as 1985, and just some recollections from them. Uh, they, they, they are being helped along by Beverly, who, as you might remember, has been our archivist, <clears throat> Beverly Francis, and they, of course, have a lot of photographs and videos themselves. So this is shaping up to be a really neat walk down memory lane. You'll wanna be there on Thursday, April 15th. Uh, if you have feedback to send, please send it to me at englishprogram at cdny.org. And if you wish, you can make a donation uh, to cdny.org forward slash give. Uh, I wanna introduce our team. Uh, I, once again, I'm Dorothy Cummings hosting and talking at you. Jeff Berry, thank you for running Zoom controls and the live stream to Facebook. Margaret Berry, thank you for collecting uh, Q&A questions and for letting everybody in at the door. And on to our main event, Daniel Popowich. Tonight's program is Music Theory for Country Dancers, part two. Uh, and what does Music Theory for Country Dancers have to do with the time signature? Daniel talked us through the basics in the fall and he got some questions and now he is going to follow up on that and answer those questions. I'm going to stop screen sharing. He's going to start. Bear with me. There we go. And Daniel, it is over to you. Um, Margaret, would you please spotlight Daniel? Hello, I think. One second. There we go. Am I up and running? You are. Okay, excellent. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dorothy, and thank you, Margaret and Jeff, for helping out with the technology tonight. Uh, as Dorothy said, this is uh, Music Theory for the Country Dancer, the sequel. Uh, last December, I did uh, a part one. And in our last episode, I uh, talked about why I English country dance. Uh, and 
not surprisingly, it's all about the music. Um, compared to other social dance forms, it was ECD where I found uh, the gamut of human expression in the music. And was, ECD has always been about the joy of expressing the music in, in the dance. I also talked about what a caller thinks about when programming um, a mix of moods, formations, key signatures, and time signatures. Again, mostly it's about the music. I also reviewed um, uh, time signatures. Most of the talk was about time signatures and bars of music per section of music and how that informed us as we dance. And when I put it all together, I was able to talk about how we can how the music helps us break down a fussy dance. I use knives and forks and how the choreography lined up with the bars of music, how, how that can clarify how we move through a dance with many fussy transitions. I talked about how we can reconstruct a dance from instructions. I used the ball instructions for take a dance, you know, just the aid memoir you get in a ball booklet and that plus the music could show how you can reconstruct a dance, how we actually dance it. And I talked about how um, the music can help us with a challenging phrase of music. I used the B section of Red and All Red, where the first man leads his partner around and travels around the whole set. And by careful attention to how much music we have, it helped inform how we needed to move through it, move through that figure. In tonight's episode, I'll do a quick review of the rhythm notation and time signatures, just so we have a baseline. Uh, and I'll review the answers to last episode's cliffhangers. Uh, there were three main questions from last December. Uh, one was, what exercises might I do if I can't dance to the beat? Most of my talk discussed how we move, mostly one step per beat. And the question was raised, what if I have trouble hearing or feeling the beat? Um, I'll offer a few suggestions. Also, how much music should I take? Uh, how much music should I take to dance non-walking steps, ran steps, skip change? As I said, most of my talk focused on walking steps, one per beat, uh, which is what we mostly do. And I think it was Paul Ross said, well, what about a skip change? How much music does that take? And um, um, I'll, um, I'll talk about that, how we can figure that out. And uh, sort of the main question was, about, what about phrases, uh, moves that cross the phrase of the music? You know, all the examples from my talk last uh, time use dances where the choreography fell within a phrase of music. Um, as Dorothy put it to me, we were dancing within the lines in, in those dances. Um, and I'll look at a few dances where dancing across the phrase of music presents some challenges to, to the dancers. Okay, onward. Rhythm notation review. Uh, at the top of the graph, we have a whole note, which is divided into two half notes, and the half notes into two quarter notes, and so on. And you can see it's very mathematical. Two eighth notes is a quarter note, which is two quarter notes is a half note, and then a whole note. And how long are these notes? Well, that depends on the beats per minute. What's important is that they are relative to each other. So when you're looking at a sheet of music, if you see two quarter notes, they are half as long as a, a half note you may see. And likewise, there are rest notations, a whole rest, half rest, quarter rest, eighth rest. Time signatures. Uh, as discussed uh, last time, we have duple meter, triple meter, and quadruple meter. And they essentially represent how many beats per bar. Duple meter, there are two beats per bar. And so for most of the dances we do with one step per beat, we do two steps per bar in a duple meter, three steps per bar for a triple meter, four steps for a quadruple meter. And um, there are, there's simple meter where each beat is divided by twos, which we see uh, like in two, two and two, four. Um, and then there's 
compound meter where we each beat is divided by threes, which we see in six, eight, nine, eight. Um, so it's even six, eight looks like there's six beats there. We still dance it. It's da 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 da. Or in um, nine eight, which we also call slip jigs, da 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 da. It's still just three beats to the bar. Okay. Uh, with that review, break out your number two pencils and let's move along. Walking to the beat. Okay, so um, the question was, uh, what if I can't walk to the beat? And um, and I, I have a caveat here. I am not a physical therapist. I'm not a musicologist or even a psychoanalyst. What follows is something akin to... Um, if you were to contact me before a Tuesday CDNY dance and say, hey, at the next dance, would you help me during the beginner session? Can we go downstairs and can you offer me some help in walking to the beat? Um, that's what I'm going, th th that's kind of the, how I'm, I'm thinking about my advice here. Um, and uh, I'll say it begins with every musician's friend which is uh, using a, um, a metronome is, is, is mainly my advice. If you are really having trouble hearing a beat, um, using a metronome can help. Um, I have on my phone here, here, I'll show you the screen. So I have a metronome here. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, lots of squares, which uh, you can press one, I'll press the 108. And it starts playing 108 beats a minute, or 72. You can see it's a lot slower, or 144. And you know, musicians that are you know really concerned about playing to a steady beat, their friend is the metronome, and it should be no different to a dancer, especially a dancer that may have trouble hearing hearing the beat. Another um, uh, great feature of this metronome app, and if you're curious, I can um, get you the model. It also has a, a, a tapping feature. Here, I'm going to play a little piece of music that'll come up later. I'll play a little Easter Thursday. <laughs> tapping as I listen. And this is a way you can find what the rhythm of a tune is. So then, so here are the exercises you might want to try. So with the metronome playing, I'll clap to the beat. And you keep doing this until you can't take it anymore. Then you might move your body to it. Just get used to moving your body to that steady beat. And eventually, start stomping to the beat. And then you might start walking to the beat. Just keep practicing stepping to the beat. Then you might do some English country dance moves to the beat. Setting. Turn single. Setting. Turn single. Um, any other ECD moves, so of up a double and back. Set and turn single. That again.
So um, your mileage may vary, but those are some extra. Again, I imagine that's something you just keep, you could keep working on. All right. Uh, how much music for a skip change, a skip, a rant? Uh, we'll look at how much music each of these takes. Um, but instead of just feeding you the answer, you know, feeding you fish, I'm going to teach you how to fish. That is, I'll review how you can figure out how much music any uh, stepping takes. So for a skip change uh, or any figure, count how much music uh, for, you know, how many bars and beats for a phrase of music. For example, for a 2-2 two -two dance, again, remember 2-2 two -two dance would be duple meter, two beats per bar. If there are eight bars in uh, an A, two times eight, you'd have 16 beats. And then you can dance that phrase of music with a skip change, counting how many skip changes for the given music. So you may count eight skip changes for that um, eight bar phrase. And then do the math. If you had eight skip changes and eight bars, that means there's one skip change per bar. So a skip change takes two beats. So I'm going to look at, uh, let's look at Kelstrom Gardens. It's 2-2, two, two, or cut times 2-2. Two, two. It's eight bars of music. Uh, you'll note the A music here is a bit oddly uh, written out. The, it is eight bars. The eighth bar is that whole note on the second uh, staff. So it's 2-2, two, two, duple meter, two beats per measure, times eight measures, 16 beats. And the next slide, we'll watch my lovely assistant, my muse, uh, dance skip changes for 1A. Um, actually, first, before we do that, let me uh, play a little of the music so you can remind yourself of um, Kelsey Gardens. <laughs> All right, so let's watch uh, the lovely Dorothy dance. Did you catch that? Did you count how many there are? Um, just because I want to watch her dance again, um, let's, I'll count it out this time. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight skip changes for eight bars in music, one skip change, two beats. For a simple skip, I'll use the same music, Kelsey and Gardens. So again, two, two, eight bars or 16 beats. Um, uh, you'll, uh, there's, you'll count, you'll see there, Dorothy will actually do 16 skips, two skips per bar. So when you do a simple skip step, it's one per beat. And it's a bit out of sync. Um, that's a bit out of sync. Um, uh, we've been having trouble with that slide, but uh, it was, trust me, 16 skips in that eight bar. So for a skip change, you see two beats per skip. Um, uh, and for skips, one beat. How about the rant? It's what we've all been waiting for. I know I can just hear it from all of you, but what about the rant? Uh, we'll look at Morpeth rant. Um, the quintessential rant that we do. Let's listen to the music. Again, it is uh, cut time, 2-2. Two, two. There are eight bars of music in the phrase. So there are 16 beats in the A. Uh, two, two, right, just said all that. And you'll see how many rants in that bar, eight. And uh, so it's one rant 
per bar two beats for a rant. This music um, uh, ripped from YouTube video. Um, I couldn't find the attribution. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed just how stern this guy looks. I mean, I don't think he cracked a smile once. You might, it's like a chiseled determination to, to not smile. But um, I trust you, trust me, he was rippling with joy inside doing, doing the rinse. So, um, so we saw uh, a lot of these dance figures, they, uh, these multi-step dance figures, they're one bar. Um, the skip change is one bar of music. The rant step is one bar of music. The waltz step, of course, is one bar of music. So that, that's a hint. But that's a schematic of how you can uh, figure out how much music a particular dance step makes. OK, uh, to the my main thing I wanted to talk about was phrases of music, dancing across the phrase of music. But first, what is a phrase? Uh, there, I'm sure there are technical uh, definitions, but mostly it's a musical thought. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, some definitions I saw say it even has punctuation with a cadence at the end. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at a dance from last December, one with uh, choreography fit within the phrases of music. Uh, so take a dance. Uh, again, let's look at the dance. It's in 6 8, it's in duple meter, eight bars in music, so 16 steps per. And if you look at the phrasing, I've, I've marked out the phrasing. Um, you know, is it uh, what, one eight bar phrase or is it two repeated four bar phrases? Uh, a professional may have an objective answer, but uh, to my lay ears, um, I hear two four bar phrases. And later dances, we'll see similar patterns where the, and this happens a lot in our music. There's a four bar phrase and then the second four bars and that overarching eight bar is, is a, a shadow of the first four bars. Um, but here in this dance, I hear uh, distinct four bar phrases. Um, in the next slide, uh, which is actually from my December talk, you'll see the little red boxes move, which represent one step per. Uh, the music was ripped from a YouTube, a, from Germantown Country Dance Ball Prep from 2016. Peggy, um, Libby, Adam, Oletska, Alexa, Tonya Rotenberg, and Weston. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Hear those four bar phrases. And then it gets repeated. And the choreography, you can see, fits very beautifully within that. Nothing crosses those phrases in music. So the music really helps us uh, with our phrasing. We're not dancing uh, against it. Um, it, it often cues us. Um, now I want to look at a simple dance, start with a simple dance where we do dance across the phrase of the music. It's, it's not complicated. It, it, it doesn't, I don't think, cause any hiccups for us as dancers, but, but it illustrates the problem uh, or, or it illustrates dancing across the phrase of music. So looking at Jack's health. Uh, so one's cross and go below, two hand turn, the end facing the neighbor, neighbors back to back, neighbors fall back. That's all pretty straightforward. Now look at the B. The B has a four, uh, um, uh, a four bar phrase, then an eight bar phrase, and then a four bar phrase. That's a, that's a bit unusual. So we have, uh, um, 
And so the way that looks is this on the music. The A's are pretty straightforward, but look at the four changes. It starts at the end of uh, the end of the first part of the B music and finishes at the next. So it looks like this. So you can see the four changes begins at the end of one phrase and finishes at the um, end. Um, <clears throat> let me play a little of the music and you can hear that. So here comes the B where neighbors come forward and Cloverleaf turns single and now they start the four changes. And now they're finishing their four changes. And partners to each other. So again, this isn't, this just illustrates it and it's not a dance that, um, causes, I don't think anyone any trouble in dancing across the phrase of music, um, but it's a dance we're all familiar with. In the next slide, I'm going to show you a video from the Brattleboro Ball 2010. Uh, video is courtesy our own Jeff Berry. Music is Karen Axelrod, Kate Burns, and Lydia Ivins. Uh, so not only, you'll, you'll see, of course, this figure, but there's another great thing sort of tangential to, to my topic. One of the great things about this video, we'll watch two rounds of it. And in the second round, the band changes the music from uh, jig time to 2-2. Two -two. The, the tempo stays the same, but they, they change up the rhythm. And it is really fascinating to watch how it changes how the dancers dance. Here comes the B part, come forward, cloverleaf, and here's the four changes starting at the end of one phrase and finishing at the next. And watch how the dancers change up. Suddenly you see Padaba stepping, Smiles too. For that. And what's great is now the band's about to change back and the dancers smooth out their dancing together. That's fun. Okay, here's a dance that causes more problems. So, um, in this dance, A Trip to Kilburn, the, the music suggests, uh, I think, a lot of false starts and doesn't cue the dancers very well because we, uh, in a few places, we dance across the phrase of music. Uh, a few notes about the structure of the dance. It's a triple minor. So there's ones, twos, and threes. Uh, it's in two, two. Again, so it's duple minor, eight bars for the A and B, so 16 beats per A and B. The phrasing of the music. Um, the, the A part has, uh, it's, it's an overarching a, uh, eight bar phrase, but it has two very distinct four bar sub phrases. And then the, the, um, the B is just one long phrase. I'm gonna play the music so you can remind yourself. This is uh, the Baltimore Consort from their CD, A Trip to Kill Room. And the second phrase. And the second phrase. And then the B.
so, um, oops. So here's the dance. Um, And the A, it begins with the ones they cast to middle place, and then they circle, and then they lead down. And notice it's four steps, eight steps, four steps. So the cast is two bars, the circle is four bars, and then the lead down is two more bars. And then that gets repeated by the ones moving back up the set. And then the B1 music, there's a two bar cast, four steps, followed by, um, a six bar circle six, so 12 steps. And then also in the B music, there's a, a not, not, it's a challenge. It's not really about moving across the phrasing music, but there's four quick changes. You notice there's four bars to do four changes. So if you do the math on that, that means you need to do one change per bar. So they're quick. You only have two steps to do each bar. So how does that look on the music? Right. So you have a four step cast, an eight step circle, a four step lead. And then in that B section, you have that four step cast again, and then that big long circle. And also note the, the four quick changes. Uh, there, the music, yep, da 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 the music doesn't really um, uh, help you out. And, and what happens a lot in this dance, it, it gets a little mushy when, it, when people dance it. Um, particularly that coming out of the circle, the lead, the next cast, uh, the, the music doesn't really help you with, because you're dancing across the phrase of the music, where does that, where does that lead begin? So um, it, it's, it, it, there's a, a cognitive disconnect between the music and the choreography, which um, I find interesting, uh, sometimes exciting, because I, I really have to focus and work on it. Um, uh, anyway, I want to show a video next. It is from the Boston Center. I believe it's a 2020 ball prep uh, video. It, it, uh, I got, caught it off of YouTube. I, it didn't say explicitly what it was for. The music is Gene Monroe. And I just want to say, this is one of the most beautiful renditions of Trip to Kilburn I've seen. They are dancing all of these phrases that I've just mentioned, all the dance moves, just, just right on. So this is a joy to watch. four step lead and cast two, three, four and circle. And four step lead and cast two, three, four circle. And watch the four quick changes, two steps per. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Beautiful. I'm going to do one more dance. Uh, another very, uh, tends to be very challenging dance, both because the tempo is slow and it's generally people have a harder time dancing slow tempos, controlling their body in a slow tempo. But also you are dancing off the phrase of the music throughout the A. Uh, Easter Thursday, note it is in three, two. So there are three beats per bar, three steps per bar. There are six bar A's and B's. So six times three, there are 18 beats per A and B. And this is how the music is phrased. Um, it has three two-bar subphrases making up an overarching six-bar phrase. 
and the B music has a four bar phrase with a little two bar coda. Uh, let me play. This is from 2010 CDNY ball prep, Cynthia Shaw and John Austin. We have these two bar little sub phrases in the music, but look at the choreography. It's three bars. Right? We have three bar back to back with neighbor and then partner. And those, because you have three bars or three steps, it's typically danced three steps to cross, three steps to side, and then three to back up. And then again, three bars to two hand churn. Um, and a lot of times people are just all over the place. If you're calling this and you're looking out, people are all over the place with their circles. It's really hard to do a nine step circle, uh, two hand turn, nine, nine step, two hand turn. Uh, the, uh, the B is, is more straightforward, but this is how it, it looks. You can see how those um, back to backs and two hand turns just fall across the, the phrase. And let's watch a video of this. Um, this is from, again, the Germantown Country Dancers 2019, I think a ball prep video. Uh, again, the video didn't say music, uh, Sophie Chang and David Knight. See how they open up just beautifully. Here, the music helps because there you do one of those for each bar. Well, that is the answers to your questions. Um, I hope you have more questions and maybe we can do something else uh, like this again. Oh, wait, but before we go, before uh, I hand the back over to Dorothy, um, this has nothing to do with my talk, um, but I came across something and I thought, who better to share this with than, um, than, than English country dancers? Um, I, I came across this documentary. I, I hadn't seen it before. And um, I'm, it, it, it's kind of an important documentary. And I just, I just you know, it's about the history of English country dancing. It. And so I, I just, I, um, I wanted to share it with you. So here we go.
Yeah, it is definitely April 1. Thank you, <laughs> Daniel, for that April Fool's Day delight. And oh yeah, and for teaching us about musical phrasing. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, before we return to the, the real questions that I, I have a couple of, um, one that I need to throw at you is, where did you find that Mr. Softy video? So when I was um, putting that together, I knew I wanted to end with, well, I had a lot of different ideas. Um, and, but I, I, I just thought, okay, because in New York, I mean, we started hearing Mr. Softy, I think on March 4th this year, it was unbelievable. It's quite the, the, the earworm. So I thought, okay, I, I, I want to include Cecil Sharp, Cecil Flat, excuse me, um, having done a reconstruction using that tune. So I thought when I came to it, I said, okay, I'm gonna to go to YouTube and I'll find, um, I will uh, find, uh, here, oh, let me share my screen again. And um, I found <laughs> someone has put on YouTube 12 hours of um, <laughs> Mr. Softy. <laughs> and I <laughs> just incredible. I mean, for 12 hours you can listen to Mr. Softy. I did the math. I think it's 1,440 times you could, um, you can listen to it. So there it is the, the answer to that question. That is very, very special. Yes, All right. it is. With 12 hours. Okay. <laughs> I'm amused. That, that is, yeah, yeah. Thank you for Cecil Flat and everything happening on April 1. Um, all right. All, all this April fool, foolery. Um, but we have serious questions. We have serious questions. Better than that fireplace video, somebody says. Where is there? So we actually have questions about the content that you presented. One thing that we had was a request um, showing the tapping of the metronome, you know, the metronome, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, the app where it lets you tap. Could you do that? Could you, dem could you just demonstrate doing that with some music playing? Because that was um, okay. That was very so, brief. That was very brief. Okay, so here I have that same that same app that you saw the pictures of, and it has uh, a button, so it comes to this tap, and I will let me. Are you here? You're not hearing that music now? No. Okay. So I'm just tapping on this to the beat. And what it's doing is it's over time, it's giving me an average of my taps. Then um, and what was the verdict in that case? That was ninety beats per minute. Okay. And so, um, if you're not sure what something is, so you can do this, and then you could even. Um, if you're trying to do like what learning how to do the doing the walk to the temple, it, it's a little challenging to then play this with the music um, because sometimes, but you can, if you're listening to the beat, you can, you know, have it start right on it and you can get it, the metronome playing to the music at that beat. And so you could be, that could be an A to, um, to those Thank answers. you. Okay, before I turn it over to Margaret for any further questions in chat, I I have a question for you about um, 
dancing across the phrase. For instance, in Trip to Kilburn, we saw that the phrases were eight counts and eight counts, and yet you danced four counts, then eight counts in the middle, then four counts. So what? Like what, what, what does knowing this do? What difference does it make? Well, if you are just strictly counting your steps and you know, not, not a whole heck of a lot, right? If you know the dance and you know how many steps something takes, then this may or may not help you. But um, there's, I think there's, a, I think it's psychological. There's a cognitive disconnect that happens in our brains. And we, we for most of our dances, we get strong clues from the music. We start here, we end here. Um, but in dances like Trip to Kilburn or uh, Easter Thursday, the dance doesn't give us any clues. And if you just know that about that dance, um, then that might help free you from trying to dance it to the music because the music is giving you false starts. Um, and also, I, for me, I just revel in those, in those dances where there's that little cognitive disconnect. Um, I, I find that uh, very enjoyable. Maybe it's a sense of that I've conquered it. Go, Daniel. So um, I, um, I am going to see, Margaret, I believe we've collected some questions from the chat box. Would you care to, to launch some at Daniel? Yes, first we had a few comments, but uh, one was, uh, Daniel, just to add on to what you just said, uh, Dorothy earlier wrote about believing it. So <laughs> knowing what it is and believing it, and Lynn also wrote about, um, it, it, you really, if you really know what to do next and how your bodies need to be oriented, um, it, about moving with confidence. And then the mm -hmm. other comment from earlier is very important. Beverly Francis pointed out that the King Sessing Morris wrote a dance to the Mr. Softy tune. So. Yes, yes, this is very important. So there has been a reconstruction. <laughs> now we have a question for you. Going back to the metronome and the beat, uh, Sarah Munz wants to know, how do you progress from people hearing the beat of a metronome and then to hearing the beats in the music, in the, in the dance music. Ah, that is a, yeah, some people just hear the music and they can immediately start clapping to it or walking to it. And um, I think, uh, I, I see Chip is on the call. He might have some um, advice there, but I, I really do think it's, it's practice. I, I, um, musicians, uh, as a once musician, um, you know, practicing with the metronome, it, you know, to be able to play on that steady beat and to hear it. Um, so if you can tap to that beat, if that's a start, and then you can play the metronome with the music, then that might help you hear hear the beat, feel the beat, and you just acquire over time, uh, it's practice. Well, I don't think that really answers my question because okay. I have some mu musician friends who are wonderful musicians and absolutely terrible dancers. <laughs> ah. I, I, I've, I've known some of them. There are tunes where you're, you're listening, and this is something I've observed with uh, Zoom dancing, when you can't, when you don't have any visual cues, all you have is the oral cues. If you're listening to a piece of music, especially one that you're not familiar with, sometimes it's really hard to tell where the beat is in that music, and that's not sure. something I usually have a problem with. Yeah, and there are times when I'm on the dance floor. metronome does not really translate into, I can't hear the beat of the music. Sure, and there are certainly times I've been on the dance floor and I'm kind of fumbling around because I'm, I'm not hearing it. I'm just not hearing the phrasing. I'm not hearing the beat. And um, 
sometimes it's just the musicians that night. Sometimes it's because we're up my heads that night. And sometimes there's just tunes that are, um, they're, they're just a little mushy. Um, they, they don't offer a strong uh, beat. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, when you talk about, a, you know, musicians who could play a steady beat and they get on the dance floor and they don't know how to do it. Again, I think that comes down to practice. They, op they clearly know how to um, hear a beat and play a beat, but the actual mechanics of moving your body to a steady rhythm. I, I, I again, I'm not a, I, I'm, I'm not a professional in this. I just know this from my 30 plus year, 35 years of dancing. It's, it's practice to actually move your body mechanically to a steady beat. Um, and maybe I, if other callers or dancers or musicians have ideas, uh, open it up, I'm not necessarily an expert. Yeah, Chip did chime in in the uh, in the chat, and I like this comment. Pianists and other rhythm instruments can be very helpful, or alternatively unhelpful to the struggling <laughs> dance. And I know uh, Paul has something he'd like to contribute. I see your hand. Go ahead, Paul. All right, let me put the hand down. Uh, hi, Daniel. Very interesting. Very enjoyable, and informative. I have an anecdote uh, that I'd like to share. Please. Uh, and, and another anecdote uh, that came to mind in response to Sarah's question. So in response to Sarah's question, um, you may know the musician Lisa Terry. She's a very well-known uh, viola da gamba player. And when you watch, uh, she, by the way, she also, of course, uh, plays on Tuesday nights for uh, English dancing in New York. And if you watch her play from the waist up, when, when she has that bow and instrument in her hand, she's really dancing. And she once said to me, I want to learn how to do this with the other half of my body. <laughs> and I asked her, where did you learn to move like that with your instrument? Uh, you know, as you were learning uh, to play the, the gamba. And she said, I learned to move like that from Carlos Vitante. And Carlos Vitante is, you know, a spectacular Baroque dancer. Uh, um, so it's interesting how music and dance um, alternated in her, in her learning. The, the anecdote that I wanted to share about uh, how the band can contribute to fitting the dance to the music um, comes from an early 2000 free for all uh, where I think it was uh, a joyful noise was playing. And Freed was introducing her dance, The English Poacher, which is set to a tune with an odd, an unusual number of uh, bars. Uh, the B music has 12 bars in it. And, or sorry, 10 bars in it. And in, um, in the B music, the corner dancers do a complete figure eight around the other standing corners. And then those actives cross by the left shoulder on the diagonal, diagonal and set to their partner. And the dancers simply could not get it. And Danny Beerbaum said, Freet, if I put a little pause just before uh, bar nine, would that help? And Freet said, yes, he did it and it helped. Everybody got the, the where the setting fit in the, in the music. So as Chip has already pointed out, yes, the band can be very helpful. That sounds like that punctuation that Daniel was talking about reading before in other people's comments about musical phrases, that that's, that's punctuation that tells you pause here because you're gonna change and do something else. Exactly, and the punctuation was not um, an emphatic note, but a silence. Yeah. Silence well, is so powerful. Cynthia mentioned that in, a, in one of her things, you know, silence, 
you know, a, a pause in the music. Silence is part of the music. Um, just as much as as um, any note played, and you know, along these lines, you know, um, a dance like Easter Thursday, there are no, there is, you know, or or a trip to Kilburn, in those moments, there are, there's no punctuation, there's there's no hint. So uh, in Easter Thursday, when I'm dancing it, if I'm not counting the the beats, and I even after all these years, I still sometimes do. I do notice which foot I'm about to land on for the second back-to-back -back or the second two-hand turn. And if it's the left foot, I know I'm with the, the dance phrasing. If it's the left foot, you know you're right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is terrific. Um, before we, uh, do we have any further questions that we haven't been able to get to yet? Margaret or Jeff or anybody uh, who's on the call? It was just the comment that uh, Karen Axelrod also talked about that, the silence in her Five Things talk recently. Wonderful. Well, I want to give a great big thank you to Daniel Popovich for reprising and, and going further on, on the, the structure of the music, that thing that we dance to, the timing, uh, the, the meter. Thank you, Daniel, and for going across the phrase. Um, I would.